Well, friends, welcome again to Westminster Seminary, California, either in person, which is something that I love saying, having not, not been able to say that for the last year, or online. Thanks for joining us in our living room here as we continue our final day of uh, the Dendulk Lecture Series. I'm in a, a bit of a storytelling mood, so if I can tell just one story, as many of you know, uh, we've had a number of presidents in our 40-year history. Our school is now middle-aged. Uh, three Roberts successively, Robert Strimple, Robert Dendolk, as well as Robert Godfrey, who recently retired about four years ago. What's amazing is that you see fingerprints of their work at various times. One of the privileges that I have is that I get to see the workings of the seminary behind the scenes, whether it be documents or donors or graduates who come on campus and who encourage us even by their presence and the gifts that were provided in the past. Even yesterday, we spent most of our day working through a particular document and a particular group of partners that Robert Dendolk many years prior already worked on. And we're still receiving benefits from those relationships that he built many years ago. We are standing on the shoulders of many who walked before us, fathers and mothers of our institution, and we're grateful for them, and we remember them. And this is one of the ways that we remember their efforts, as well as their sacrifices for this institution. Uh, we remember Robert and Nellie Dendolk and their continued ministry among us for many years, 30 plus years in the Westminster seminaries. And their desire was that our graduates not only know Jesus, but they be like Jesus in the way they serve the churches. For seminaries like us, we exist for the churches, not the other way around. And their hope was that we can challenge and inspire future pastors and leaders of churches by bringing seasoned, experienced, wise leaders to this uh, 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 school so that they can teach us while they're here with us. So this year, we're so grateful that our speaker is someone who was here the second year when Robert Dendolk was indeed here, along with his wife, Nellie. He, the school at that time was meeting in San Marcos. He has some funny stories back then where we were meeting in a warehouse. Many of you may not know that the building where the library ha was, is housed is the only building we had from 1982 to 1996. And then 1996 is when the student lounge and the, uh, the um, classrooms were built. And then this was built in 2001, and then 2018 for the student housing. That's a little bit of history here. All that to say, Kim lived through those 40 years, and we're so grateful that he is here teaching us about ministry, continuing his lectures, and this morning, he'll be uh, teaching on preaching and biblical theology, his final part. We're so delighted, Kim. You and Mickey are here. Thanks for being with us. Let's welcome him. Thank you. It is indeed a privilege to be here, being a veteran of four presidential administrations. <laughs> I remember Bob Strimple very well. I remember the Dendulks very well, Bob Godfrey very well. And now it's a privilege to be here under the Kim administration. So, proud veteran. Uh, I also want to thank President Kim and the folks at the seminary for your uh, warm and gracious hospitality. We've been treated very well. It's been great to come back on campus. I don't get here as much as uh, I'd like. Uh, Orange County is a fair bit away and traffic uh, is an issue. I can't believe that the three years I was in seminary here, I commuted the same route and um, I had no automotive issues and didn't get a single ticket. So in the providence of God, I made it through my seminary years commuting all that way. And every time we come back, it it seems farther because there's so much more traffic. So it's, it's, I wish I could be here more often. It's just one of those things that we may have to move closer someday to solve that problem. In this third and final lecture, I'll discuss the benefit of placing the box top of redemptive history before a congregation in order to provide the big picture categories necessary to interpret the Bible correctly. Teaching these big picture categories to our hearers will enable them to better resist the pull toward the subjective turn that is associated with contemporary American spirituality a turn that sadly renders the Bible irrelevant, a turn that pulls biblical passages out of context, or which understands the Bible as something other than revelation from God. 
Reading and understanding the Bible through a lens of a well-thought-out biblical theology goes a long way toward helping us to draw proper conclusions about what kind of book the Bible is, as well as guiding us to the proper application we have to draw from those doctrinal dots that we connect together. So building upon the previous lectures, I'll focus in this lecture upon the interpretive framework developed along the lines Dr. Horton describes as the internal architecture of Scripture, God's covenants. God's story, as revealed in his word, is tied to specific historical events that make up that story. And as such, this story is true. And it comes to us in words and with sentences, subjects, verbs, and objects, thereby summoning us to look outside ourselves and not turn within. Telling God's story challenges all personal, all subjective mythologies, and is actually far more interesting than anything any one of us can dream up. Now, the panorama of the redemptive drama flows out of this covenant history, and it takes us from the moment of creation to Eden to Adam's fall uh, to the person work of a second Adam, Jesus, including his death, resurrection, and ascension, to a new creation when our fallen universe at long last becomes the home of an everlasting righteousness. And that panoramic view, that big picture, provides us with the big picture categories, the box top, if you would, uh, the importance of which we'll talk about in the balance of our time this morning. As we turn then to the relationship between preaching and biblical theology, again, we're reminded of the connection between the facts of God's redemptive words and deeds and essential Christian doctrines that are connected to them. The father of Reformed biblical theology, Gerhardus Voss, writes, and I'm quoting, if we can show that revealed religion is inseparably linked to a system of supernatural historical facts at its culminating epoch in Christ, as we think can be done, we can see, quoting again, the faith of the apostles and the faith of the apostolic church revolved around the great redemptive facts in which they found the interpretation of the inner meaning of the Savior's life. To the earliest Christian consciousness, doctrine and fact were wedded at the outset. And so the key event in the Bible, of course, is our Lord's Messianic mission. It takes place in a very specific context, one foretold throughout the Old Testament through the words of Moses and the prophets. Promise becomes fulfillment because God's self-revelation is inseparable from these very historical events. And so there's a discernible and definite progress in the biblical narrative toward a final and ultimate goal, which is the renewal of the cosmos and the redemption of God's people. In the first lecture, I addressed the importance of preaching apologetically. And by that, I mean grounding our preaching in the fact that Christianity is at its heart a truth claim, a claim tied to specific historical events. And so when we take the box top and look at the succession of such events, we have that period after Noah, the age of the patriarchs, the exodus, the conquest, the exile and return, Christ's life and messianic mission, his death, resurrection, Pentecost, the ascension, all pointing ahead to our Lord's return and the final consummation. In our second lecture, we discuss the importance of preaching from biblical texts through the lens of a system of theology. And that enables us as preachers to lay out the dots, so to speak, and then connect them for those in our congregations who otherwise might not see or make those connections. A biblically-based systematic theology provides the proper theological categories through which to understand the Bible as revelation of God's story in history. And doing so exposes the futility of the turn toward the subjective and those self-referential epistemologies typical of contemporary American spirituality. Pushing our hearers to consider what God said and what God did is a very powerful antidote to subjective feelings and self-justifying opinions or that answer to that misguided question we hear far too often, what does this verse mean to you? Well, in this lecture, we're going to consider and continue to consider these big picture categories, but this time from the perspective of their historical development in Scripture. We're looking at categories as they develop throughout the course of redemptive history. Uh, some have spoken of this as a line, 
and not topically as in systematics, which some have spoken of as a circle. We already know many of the proof texts for our doctrines, so the challenge is to look and see how these doctrines extend throughout the whole of Scripture, and which challenge those who have taken this subjective turn. So, we'll consider a couple of big picture themes we discussed last time, the doctrine of creation, although now we're going to look at it from the flip side of the creator, uh, creature, uh, the creator creation distinction. We're going to look at what it means to be a divine image bearer, which is the high point of the creation account. And then we'll very briefly survey the covenants, redemption, work, and grace before considering the second Adam and his work and the hope of a final consummation. By just laying out in a flyover the big picture categories in our preaching through the biblical text, it's easy to see the unity of the story of redemption as well as its factual and objective character. This external word anchored in specific redemptive events directs our attention to God who reveals himself in Jesus Christ, and it warns us not to dive into the subjective morass of contemporary American spirituality. Well, let's take a brief look at the doctrine of creation. The doctrine of God, of course, the creator, demands a corresponding Christian doctrine of creation. And to this end, there are three points to consider briefly as we reflect upon the created order, things seen and things unseen. First, Scripture tells us God created all things, and nothing which now exists does so apart from the fact that God created it. All created things exist through God's eternal decree. And second, God created all things and is therefore distinct from all created things. This is the creator-creature distinction. Creation is not divine, as in some sort of pantheism, nor does it exist within the being of God, a, a panentheism. The creator-creature distinction stands over all pantheistic impulses, and that, of course, drives so much of contemporary American spirituality. The creator-creature distinction then uh, points to a God who cr created all things and then pronounced them good, a refrain that is repeated throughout the creation account in Genesis chapter 1. These three points constitute a distinct Christian doctrine of creation, and that should inform our preaching from Genesis to Revelation. The Christian doctrine of creation precludes any notion that God formed our universe out of eternal matter, or that there was a realm of eternal and ideal forms, which matter is inherently deficient in contrast to the spiritual. These are the fingerprints left by Plato. The doctrine of creation insists that before all things came into being, God was completely free and independent, God created all things from nothing, creation ex nihilo, and he did so through his creative word. God said, and it is so. And so from the sun, the moon, the stars, to the sea, the land, the sky, and all the various creatures who fill these created realms, all things were created by God who spoke them into existence. And all things include things we can see, the visible world in which we live, and for which we have been created, as well as things we cannot see, the angels and the invisible world. And as you can gather, this has significant ramifications. The Christian view of creation directly challenges the basic presuppositions of contemporary American spirituality. There are no pre-existent human souls. There is no migration of eternal souls as in reincarnation. We're not divine in any sense. The creator is to be distinguished from all created things, and any supposed dualism between spirit and matter is frankly a platonic fiction. Matter is not inherently evil nor flawed. God created all things from nothing and then pronounced them good. Well, moving on to divine image bearers then, with the language of the eighth psalm in mind, you have made man a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Cornelius Van Til once stated that Adam was created to be like God in every way in which a creature can be like God. And those words sound shocking the first time we hear them. And yet, as Van Til immediately qualifies, because Adam is a creature, humans can never be divine. Adam's progeny will always be creatures, although created in God's image, through a direct act of God in which Adam's body was formed from the dust of the earth, 
and his soul was created by God's act of breathing life into both Adam and Eve. To be human, then, is to be male or female, to bear God's image in both body and soul, which exists as a personal unity of the spiritual, the soul, and the material, the body. And because all people are divine image bearers, we are truly like God in that we possess all of the so-called communicable attributes of God, albeit in creaturely form and measure, and that is ectypally and by analogy. This constitutes us as human beings. We are distinct from the animal kingdom and, and vastly superior in moral and rational capabilities. The creation of image bearers marks the high point of the creation account as in Genesis 1, 28 through 31, when God pronounces Adam to be very good. And Reformed theologians have long argued that our bodies are, in a sense, fit organs of the soul. And it's especially through this body-soul unity that these communicable attributes are manifest. Now, the ramifications of being created as divine image bearers are profound given the current intellectual and cultural disruption of our age. Adam's task was to build the temple garden of God on earth in Eden and to rule and subdue in the name of his creator. Adam was created as fit for that task in every possible way. And Adam then is also the biological and the federal head of the human race. All humans are his biological descendants. And any evolutionary developments are post-creation and not the basis of the imago. We do not become image bearers. We are image bearers. And that, of course, speaks directly to the unity of our race in the midst of this current intersectionality scrum. Despite our different skin color or appearances, all people bear God's image, and all people are of equal dignity and value before our Creator. And that Christian doctrine of the Imago is upstream from all racial and cultural expressions. And so as divine image bearers, then, there is a unity to our race that far transcends all human differences, even though our racial and cultural differences are, of course, exacerbated by the race's fall into sin. <clears throat> As the federal head of the race, Adam acted on behalf of all of his descendants during a time of probation in Eden. Adam was commanded not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and what Adam did in Eden, he did as our representative, as though each one of us were there acting in him, this idea of corporate solidarity of our race. Adam had been created in righteousness, holiness, and he possessed true knowledge of God, as Paul tells us in his epistles. But Adam was not merely innocent before God, but he was personally holy, morally upright, possessing the natural ability to obey all of God's commandments and to fulfill the cultural mandate given in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 and following. The latter is the origin of all human culture and the institutions of society, things like government. Adam was given dominion over all of creation as God's vice regent, and God assigned to him the role of ruling over the world and naming all the creatures. And he was given plants and animals for food. And this reflects the psalmist's point, that humans are but little lower than the angels in Psalm 8.5. Adam's spiritual nature, that the soul lives on after the death of the body, reflects essential human nature. Our souls are invisible. They're indivisible. They're immortal. We are created as rational beings with great intellectual abilities, and the moral ability to determine right from wrong is hardwired within us, says Paul in Romans 2.12-16. We're also capable of receiving the revelation which God gives through the created order, general revelation, and through his word, special revelation. But the subjective turn, however, denies even the possibility of such revelation, instead seeking to identify fallen human nature and the vain imagination of that nature with the divine. To quote Paul, professing ourselves to be wise, we became fools. Well, the fall of Adam, which is the context for redemption. We speak of redemptive history because we assume that people are in need of redemption from sin. The entire course of the biblical narrative post-Eden assumes the reality of human sin 
guilt, and the curse, which of course is death. The Bible begins with the account of Adam being created in a covenant of works, a, a covenant of creation which remains in effect even after the fall. And of course, had he obeyed, he would have been glorified, the consummation would have occurred, and the temple garden in Eden would have been completed, and God would dwell with his people. But we've seen the top of the box top to the puzzle. We know what happens, and we know how this impacts the entire course of subsequent human history. Now, those who have taken the subjective turn often operate on a misguided assumption that, you know, deep down inside, people are basically good, if not a chip off the old divine block. When we consider ourselves, compare ourselves to others, you know, we might measure up pretty well. It depends on who we compare ourselves to, but sure, there's some who we might begrudgingly admit are actually better people than we are, but... We do pretty well in most of our self-comparison tests against others. Now, assuming that people are basically good, <clears throat> as do most Americans, ignores the fact that ours is a fallen race. We are under the just condemnation of God. We're awaiting the sentence of death. We're awaiting eternal punishment. And the reality is, the frank reality, the stark reality, is that God's not going to compare me to someone else who is also a fallen sinner. Instead, God's going to measure me and you against the standard of his law, which is holy and righteous and good, Paul says in Romans 7, 12. And like everyone else descended from Adam, I am not holy, righteous, or good. I am a sinner. I am naturally under the sentence of death. So in that state, if I take the subjective turn, what am I going to find? That I'm divine? That I possess an inner light? No, what I'm going to find is a blackness that should frighten me. I should discover that I'm condemned before God, that I'm guilty. And this guilt before God then is really the basis for all human angst and loneliness, our self-centered perspective on life. It's the root of our dissatisfaction with all of our possessions. And tragically, it's at the root of all of our fractured relationships that we experience throughout the course of our lives. Because Adam acted as our representative in Eden when he rebelled, we are guilty for his act of rebellion as if we had been in Eden, personally rebelling against God as Adam did. And the guilt of Adam's sin is imputed to us, as Paul tells us in Romans 5. It renders us guilty before God, and it ensures that we all have inherited a sinful nature from Adam. And it's from that sinful nature which springs our own sinful actions. We sin because we choose to sin. Frankly, at times we like to sin. And that is a far cry from the notion that we're all basically good people who occasionally fall short of rather arbitrary moral standards. Rather, the story of redemption tells us we are a sinful people whose sinful propensities lead us to individual acts of sin. And we know we were not created to be that way and our struggles to find meaning and purpose arise within because we are fallen. Ben Franklin's famous adage comes to mind, the only two things in life which are inevitable are death and taxes, and both of them stem from the fall. Death is not natural to the human race. Death is the consequence of Adam's sin. When Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we know what happened. Work became toil. Fruitful fields are filled with weeds and thistles. Childbearing became labor. Adam faced the sentence of death. As the Puritans so aptly put it, so often quoted, in Adam's fall, sin we all. We live in a fallen world in which something is fundamentally wrong and everybody knows it. Death is not a hope for release from a material world. Death is divine judgment. It is a separation of body and soul. And so, being sinful by nature and by choice, we are not now, nor have ever been innocent before God. The psalmist makes this clear in Psalm 51, verse 5, and 58, verse 3. As Paul goes on to tell us in Ephesians chapter 2, the first three verses, we're dead in sin and by nature children of wrath. And then he goes on in chapter 4 to speak of us as darkened in our understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in us due to the hardness of heart. We become callous. 
we have given ourselves up to sensuality, and we're greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Our thinking is futile, we are darkened in our understanding, we are alienated from God, and we seek now to gratify our own sinful nature rather than to please God. And that's why, inevitably, the subjective turn leads to, at best, a dead end. Well, what's the hope in all of this? We start with redemption, the covenant of grace. As you undoubtedly know, Reformed uh, covenant theology is at the center of Reformed theology. Covenant theology is our box top. It enables us to make sense of the individual biblical accounts of sinful human behavior, and yet, at the same time, look for God's greater purposes throughout. Because humanity fell in Adam, who plunged the race into sin and death, it's going to take a second Adam, Jesus, to obey the commandments, to fulfill God's righteous requirements, and then to remove the guilt of our individual sins, as well as that guilt that has been imputed to us from the federal head of our race, good old Adam. And this requires a covenant other than the covenant of works, in which God allows a redeemer to undo the consequences which Adam brought down upon our race. And so this brings us then to the covenant of grace, that covenant which unfolds from Genesis 3.15 all the way through Revelation chapter 22, verse 21. It plays out against the backdrop of this prior covenant of creation or covenant of works. Now the covenant of grace is the historical outworking of an eternal covenant, the covenant of redemption, the so-called covenant before the covenant in which the persons of the Holy Trinity decree that Jesus will perform the redemptive work on behalf of those whom God chose in Christ before the foundation of the world. God's saving grace is not directed toward the world in general, but to the specific individuals whom God intends to save. In this covenant, the Holy Spirit will apply the work of Jesus Christ to all those whom the Father has chosen and for whom the Son will die thereby ensuring that all of God's elect will come to faith in Jesus Christ through the preaching of the historical facts of the gospel, which is the divinely appointed means by which God's elect are called to faith. God determines the end, who it is that will be saved, as well as the means by which he will save them, the foolishness of preaching. Now, God's gracious covenant appears throughout redemptive history. It culminates in a new covenant that had been foretold by the prophet Jeremiah. God is the author of this gracious covenant, which is based in the promise of eternal life. It's made on behalf of sinners by a gracious God who intends to save his elect from the consequences of Adam's sin through the work of Jesus Christ. And in this covenant, everything hinges upon the sacrificial death and the perfect obedience of the only covenant mediator between the holy God and sinful humanity, Jesus. And all of that takes place in history, with specific times, in specific places, impacting people who have names and addresses. None of this takes place within me. Now, while the condition of the covenant of works was Adam's perfect personal obedience to the commandments of God, the condition of the covenant of grace is faith in Jesus Christ, who has undone the consequences of the fall. And the essence of that gracious covenant is seen in this oft-repeated refrain first found in Genesis 17, verse 7. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout the generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And if we fast forward then to the final chapter when the new Jerusalem ascends out of heaven, we hear again these wonderful and glorious words, the motto of the covenant of grace, if you will. And I heard a loud voice in the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with him. They will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. From verse 3 of Revelation chapter 21. And so then redemptive history is the outworking of God's eternal decree through the unfolding of successive covenants. There are historical manifestations of this covenant. Immediately after the fall of the human race, 
God promised Adam that a redeemer would come to rescue our race from the consequences of our sin. And so in Genesis 3.15, no sooner do we find Adam sinning than the Lord pronounces a curse upon the devil. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And so in this gospel promise, God promises to crush the serpent and save his people. This is the first promise that Jesus will come to suffer and die on a cross to redeem us from our sins. And so that covenant of grace then unfolds in historical stages. God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 and 17. The promises God made to Israel at Mount Sinai and then renewed on the plains of Moab in Deuteronomy 29 before the people entered the land of promise. The promise of an eternal kingdom made to David in 2 Samuel 7. To the prophecy of a new covenant given us by Jeremiah in chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. In which the author of the Hebrews then applies directly to Jesus Christ who is the mediator of that promised new covenant. The covenant unfolds throughout the course of redemptive history, seen primarily in this glorious fact that there's but one gospel in both Testaments, just as there's only one mediator, Jesus Christ. God promises to be our God and declares to us that we are his people. And these covenant promises bookend the story of redemption from the fall of our race until the time of the end when Jesus returns to raise the dead and judge the world and make all things new. And that's what the Bible is about. That's why it was written, to tell this story. Now, at the heart of the covenant of redemption is the incarnation. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity and the eternal Son of God, took to himself a true human nature for the purpose of saving us from our sins. And this doctrine marks Christianity off as a supernatural religion grounded in very specific truth claims. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, 2 Corinthians 5.18. And that claim stands opposed to contemporary American spirituality because its adherents aim for internal moral improvement, greater spiritual enlightenment, or even greater experiential benefit for its adherents, greater religious experience. But the incarnation of Jesus is the proof to us that God keeps his promises. And so the key turning point here then is the incarnation, and it's the key turning point in what really is the greatest story ever told. <clears throat> Just as God was pronouncing the curse upon Adam and Eve and the serpent, he promised to save Adam from uh, consequences of his sin through the seed of the woman. And that, of course, is a biological sin who will come from Eve, who will redeem God's people from sin. And so in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, God fulfills his promises as Emmanuel, God with us. The word must become flesh if any of us are to be saved from the havoc wrought upon us by the first Adam. And there is no other way. Now, at this point, I think it's helpful to realize that the Old Testament is filled with various messianic prophecies in which God's promise to redeem his people are set forth and fulfilled with amazing specificity. There are at least 61 major messianic prophecies, and every scholar seems to have a different number of them, but 61 is the most common. Uh, there are 61 major messianic prophecies regarding the coming of Jesus found throughout the course of the Old Testament, and all of which are said to be fulfilled by the coming of Jesus Christ in the new. And these are great texts upon which to preach because these prophecies are part box top while at the same time part puzzle piece. God's promise to Adam in Genesis 3.15 is fulfilled when Jesus dies upon the cross. He crushes Satan. He suffers for his people to bring about their redemption. And so it's but one illustration of God's redemptive purpose of being fulfilled like this. In Isaiah 7.14 we read, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. The long-expected Redeemer is supernaturally conceived. He's God in human flesh. The Old Testament perspective on redemption then is one of hope and expectation. A Redeemer is going to come, which is why Matthew's Gospel, 
opens with the historical record of the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Because in Matthew 1, 18 and following, we read that the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And that's also why Matthew's gospel opens with the genealogical record, tracing our Lord's ancestry back to Abraham through the line of Judah, through the house of David. And our Lord's genealogical chart is the proof that God has sent him as the promised one. Now, while the mechanics of the incarnation largely remain a mystery, Paul speaks of the incarnation in 1 Timothy 3.16 as such, great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness, Jesus was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. The mechanics are mysterious, but the fact of the incarnation is beyond all question. Jesus is fully man and fully God, as clearly taught in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, when Paul speaks of Jesus as being in the form of God and taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. Here in the incarnation, Jesus is God in human flesh. He has two natures, one human, one divine. He remains one person. In the incarnation, God came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ to save us from our sins, fulfilling the office of the covenant mediator. And so this notion of the word becoming flesh lies at the very heart of God's work of redemption. And you cannot find that savior by turning within. That Savior only comes to us through an external word, specifically through preaching. And as we move to the recreation, the second coming of Christ, and the summing up of all things, that kind of narrative story continues. Although the biblical account of redemption has taken many twists and turns, the story comes to a glorious resolution in the final chapters when we discover what was destined for God's people all along. The fallen children of Adam become imagers of Christ. There's a day coming when every injustice is going to be made right, when all human suffering will cease and every tear will be wiped from our eyes. We cannot find that hope within. We must look up and outside. On the appointed day, Jesus will return. He will raise the dead. He will judge all people. And he will renew the heavens and the earth, removing every hint and trace of our sin. And so in Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 through 4, John speaks of the Lord's return as the culmination of God's gracious covenant promise. <clears throat> and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Every believer longs for the return of Jesus Christ. That story tells us that history has an end. It has a telos. It's linear. It's not cyclical. It is not some kind of an open-ended Hegelian vortex. History is racing ahead to the Lord's return, which is a date on the calendar, if presently unknown to us. When Jesus returns, three distinct events occur in close coordination. The first is the resurrection of the dead. It's been prophesied by Daniel and Isaiah, and it includes those who will live forever blessed in the presence of Christ also mentions those who will go into eternal judgment. We'll talk about that momentarily. A second event of this complex associated with Christ's return is related to the resurrection of the dead, and it entails the final judgment of believers and unbelievers alike. And a third event, then, is the recreation, a new heaven and a new earth, the everlasting home of righteousness, the consummation of a new creation. And so the Old Testament prophets such as Daniel and Isaiah foretold that human history was going to come to an end with the universal resurrection of the dead. And Paul describes the nature of this resurrection body in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll read just a couple of verses toward the end. The trumpet will sound, 
the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? What a glorious end to this remarkable story. And yet, the final judgment also occurs when our Lord returns. For those who are Christ, this day is glorious. It's the day for which we long, but for those who are not Christ, it is the day of greatest terror. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul speaks of the Lord Jesus being revealed from heaven with these mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among those who have believed. That's from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. And then we have our Lord's words in Matthew chapter 13 when he's explaining the parable of the weeds. Jesus speaks in very similar terms. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are angels. <clears throat> Son of man will take the weeds, gather them, burn them with fire, so it'll be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, they will gather from the kingdom all causes of sin, all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then similarly, as Paul has said, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. So judgment day arrives when the dead are raised. But it's also a day of cosmic renewal. In 2 Peter 3, we read that while unbelievers scoff, the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. That's when our Lord returns. The natural order will be radically changed. All traces of human sin will be purged from the earth. The dead are raised. All our judged creation is renewed, and we dwell forever in the home of righteousness. The return of Jesus and the resurrection of our body shouts to us that heaven, eternal life, is not disembodied existence in a mythical place. In Revelation chapter 21, the balance of that chapter 9 through 27, Paul is given this, or John is given this remarkable vision of our eternal home. It's a new heaven and a new earth with the saints of God dwell with him in resurrected bodies. The heavenly city has streets of gold. It's filled with precious gems, which is a description of the new Jerusalem's unspeakable glory using analogy to earthly beauty and wealth. And then we find John's description that is Christ's church of the bride, which he has redeemed, and that church is present with the Savior in her midst. John writes, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Verse 9 of Revelation 21. And then John sees something that's just utterly remarkable. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will be never shut, and there will be no night there. They will bring in it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so when our Lord, suffering and dying on the cross, says it is finished, it is to this scene that his words ultimately direct us. And so with that, we've come to the end of our story. The great panorama of redemptive history has taken us from creation to our federal head and biological father, Adam, to the fall of our race, to redemption from the guilt and power of sin, which is ours in Christ. But the story ends with a magnificent glimpse of that glory that still lies ahead. And so let us long for that day. And as we do, look for Jesus, who is the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the glory, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Well, brothers and sisters, we live in an age of great intellectual and cultural disruption. 
And in the midst of this ongoing and sweeping change with this modern renewal of the ancient subjective turn, it is our duty to tell our hearers that God's story, which is an external word that comes to us outside, that that story guides our steps. And we need to warn our hearers that turning with them will only get you horribly lost. When we have this big picture and these categories of redemption in mind, we find that the story God tells us in his word, which is so much greater and so far more compelling than any story we can find within, that story is much greater than anything we're going to hear on the lips of those who teach this contemporary American spirituality. The subjective turn inevitably leads not to ultimate fulfillment, but into an inner void of darkness, human selfishness, human isolation, eschatological and epistemological chaos. We have no real hope if truth is my truth because what might be true on Tuesday, which may have been a good day, might turn out to be false on Friday, which is a bad day. When we preach, it is our calling to tell God's story, which comes to us through an external word, not through an inner quest. And so let us tell that story as true. And as we do, connect the theological dots for our hearers. And we should also take the time, however briefly, to explain the doctrines to which the individual biblical texts point us. But let's not do this with the contentiousness of the politics of identity, and certainly not by appealing to the religious technology to which so many of our contemporaries are now addicted. Let us strive to preach apologetically and boldly, yet winsomely affirm the truth of Christianity by simply retelling God's story. May we organize our preaching through the tried and true categories of a biblically sound reform systematic theology, which is firmly grounded in the God-given account of redemptive history. And as we have seen, the doctrinal dots are everywhere, and good preaching will help our hearers connect them. And keeping this redemptive historical box tops before us helps us as preachers tell God's story as he tells it. And so as we come to the end of our time together, we return to Charles Spurgeon once again. As preachers, we let the lion out to do its work. But it's also our duty to show our hearers the lion's claws and its teeth, this threatened curse, while at the same time reminding our hearers that those claws and sharp teeth point us to a lamb who shed blood, turns lion's claws and lion's teeth into a glorious story of redemption, which is, of course, the promised blessing. And this story always directs us outside ourselves to what God has done for us in the person and work of Jesus Christ, who died in Jerusalem on a particular Friday, a date on the calendar, who was raised three days later on a particular Sunday, a date on a calendar, and who will come again, a date on a calendar, yet unknown to us, to raise the dead, to judge the world, and to make all things new. This is a much better story. And it's a true story at that. It's a much better story than anybody can find by turning within. The best thing about being a preacher, a minister, is we get to tell this story over and over and over again. And what we learned in seminary really can help us tell that story clearer and better. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the message that it gives, the clarity that it brings, the reminder that our great hope, the return of our Savior, is yet to come. And so help us, Father, labor in our calling, faithful to your word, trusting more and more in the power of your blessed Holy Spirit to accomplish your work through the preaching of your word. Help us, Father, fearlessly, yet lovingly and compassionately call our hearers from the subjective turn to that glorious story of redemption which you so clearly tell in your word. We ask, Father, we do this so that our blessed Savior, who's, who is the heart of this story, that he would receive all praise and glory and honor. For we ask this in his most blessed and glorious name. Amen.
Well, on behalf of the faculty and staff here at Westminster Seminary, California, let me thank, again, Dr. Ritterbarger and Nikki, who joined us for this week. As a Southern California a boy, it feels like almost soaring over California, the ride at Disneyland. For those of you who are familiar, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. Thank you for your challenge. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for standing with us as, as we continue to labor in training future pastors as well. Thank you for joining us today, either in person or online. We have refreshments out back. I'm sure some of you have been looking forward to this for some time as